Hello there, this is Sam Conan at samconan.com. Welcome to the second video lesson in the Read Like a Grown-Up video course. In the last lesson, we set up your reading list and selected a time and place to read. Hopefully, you've been reading at the same time and place for the last few days now. Planning is only the first step in the method to read like a grown-up, however. Today, we're going to discuss the second step, annotation, reading with a pencil and then responding to what you've read. Annotation really just means that you use a pencil to mark up your books as you read. You mark important stuff, uh, insights, important uh, passages, things that you think are really important or that strike you as important as you read. To most people, annotation seems like a trivial thing to worry about. Why waste your time writing in books when you should be reading them? And I understand that. Time is valuable. The hours you can give to reading are usually in short supply. So shouldn't you just focus on reading? But the fact is that the simple act of writing in your books will vastly improve your reading, and it does so in four ways. First of all, annotation keeps you alert. The very fact that you have a pencil in your hand gives you more attention, it helps you read in a far more active way than you, most of us are used to. The pencil in the hand means that you have to do something with that pencil, and so you begin to look for key points and important quotations and central ideas. Secondly, annotation captures the good stuff. As we read through books, often we come across the important, important passages, important quotes, vital parts of application, beautifully written sentences, wisdom that sparkles like crystal. We want to mark this stuff so that we can process it later, after we've finished our reading. By marking it now, we can free up more resources and attention for the actual act of reading. Third, annotation chops difficult books down to size. Good readers are often reading books that are beyond their ability to easily comprehend. And annotation breaks down those difficult books into more manageable sections. Often if we, when we come across key passages in the argument now or important character details, those, those details will help us to get through difficult passages later. And so we want to annotate them when we find them. The fourth reason that annotation helps improve our reading is that it enables us to remember more and remember longer. When we read passively without a pencil, we move through the argument more quickly and with less attentiveness. But the act of annotation increases our active attention, it increases our alertness to the reading, and it helps us to remember the structure of a text for a lot longer. In fact, the single fastest way to get more out of your reading is simply to annotate, even if you never go back to read your own annotations. And this brings us to a very important point in this series. I'm teaching you a method of reading that allows you to understand everything that you read, analyze its message, and apply it to your life. This method allows you to master every book you apply it to. However, not every book is worth all that work. Francis Bacon famously said that some books should be tasted, others should be chewed, and others should be digested, something along those lines. But his point was that, you, that not every book deserves the attention of, of a great book. And so you'll only use the, the read like a grown-up method to the most important or significant books that you read, or at least you'll you only use parts of the method. I wouldn't annotate Calvin and Hobbes, but I would certainly annotate Homer's Odyssey. To get started anno annotating, you first need a simple annotation system. And here's the method I've been using for a number of years. We'll go through here pretty quickly, and then I want to actually apply this method to the story for this course, Ernest Hemingway's Big Two-Hearted River. First of all, I simply underline any sentences or phrases that are central to the argument or that clarify difficult concepts. If the passage is longer than three lines, I use a vertical line in the margin to mark it. But be careful, if you underline too much on your page, your annotations won't mean anything. Next, I use a check mark to identify which underlined passages are the most important. These passages form the outline of the argument or, or identify pivotal actions by characters or vital images to a poem. The goal of, of the check mark is that they allow me to, to pick a book up again and quickly skim its content just by focusing on the check mark passages. The third symbol I use is a, is a Q, which stands for quote. When I come across a sentence or passage that I want to remember or record, I underline it and write a capital Q in the margin. We'll be doing more with, these, with this annotation symbol later in this method. Next, I use an asterisk. 
The point of an asterisk, it's somewhat similar to a check mark, but the asterisk identifies a passage that I need to come back to later and do more thinking or writing about. Something struck me when I when I read that passage, so I put an asterisk down, knowing that, that there's more there that I have to come back to and dig out. But I don't want it to distract me from my, the process of reading that I'm engaged in now. So instead of drifting down a rabbit trail of sideways thought, I want to mark it so I can come back to it later. The next symbol is a question mark. When I come to a confusing part of a book, I don't want it to derail my reading. So I'll put a question mark in the margin and come back to it when I've finished reading the book. Often I find that questionable passages, question, passages that, that cause me to question now, often become clearer later as I continue to read through the book, or something, uh, something that the character does later in the book helps explain his odd actions now. The last uh, symbol, it's not really a symbol, but it's a, it's a visual way of marking my book, is, to, is the famous dog ear. I do, dog ear pages that contain the vitally important passages in a book. And I don't do this more than two or three times in an, in an entire book. And I don't even do it for every book, even books that I'm taking seriously and, and really annotating and, and analyzing. The point of a dog ear is that I can pull a book off the shelf later and very quickly, visually, even tangibly identify the pages that contain the the most important passages. And that's it. Here's an annotation system that is simple, complete, and consistent. If you usually annotate, chances are good that you have a similar system. If you aren't used to annotating, just steal my system, grab a pencil, and get to work. But keep in mind that annotating is meant to help you enjoy books more. It shouldn't get in the way of actual reading. So don't worry about whether you're marking the right stuff or not. Just mark what stands out to you as important or interesting. And as you continue your journey down the reading life, annotation will become much easier for you. Before I turn you loose with your pencil, though, I want to demonstrate now how to annotate. I found that for many people, annotation only really starts to make sense when they see it done. Underneath this video in the resources section is the short story we'll be reading for the rest of the lesson, Ernest Hemingway's Big Two-Hearted River. I'm going to walk you through an annotation, my annotation, of the first couple pages of this story. I'll read the section and then stop and talk you through my thought process when I annotate. Ready? Here we go. If you need to take a break now, then do so, and then come back and watch the rest of the tutorial. All right, so welcome to a a brief annotation tutorial. Uh, This is the first page of uh, The Big Two-Hearted River, the short story by Ernest Hemingway. Hopefully you've read it already. If you haven't, then be sure you do that before we go on. I'm going to work my way through here, the first uh, couple pages, and I'm going to point out some things that I would mark if I were annotating this for the first time, if I were reading it for the first time and, and marking it up with my pencil. I won't be able to use all of the annotation symbols this time, but um, that's not the the point of this tutorial is really just to help you understand how to go about starting to read, what to look for, and how to use your pencil to mark up what you're looking at. I'm using Word uh, here, and uh, I'm gonna when I write comments in, it's actually gonna show up way over here on the right margin. Um, if you were actually annotating this, you would be putting it in the left margin, so that's closer to the text. Um, but such is technology. So the opening paragraph of most stories is really important. The opening chapter um, in books or the opening paragraphs in a short story because they set the scene. They uh, are, are, the first paragraph is our introduction to the setting and what the reader or what the author thinks is really important for us to notice. And as we read this first paragraph, we notice that our protagonist, Nick Adams, has been dropped off uh, in this, this burned over country. There was no town. There used to be a town called Sini, but now it's been bur- it's burned over country. And as we get to the end of the paragraph, we read this line, these lines, the stone was chipped and split by the fire. That was It was all that was left of the town of Sini. Even the surface had been burned off the ground. At this point, we don't know why that's important, but we know that it's probably significant that a fire has passed over this town. And so we would underline it and mark uh, simply uh, burned by fire is what I would put. Uh, You may put something else. Um, But we'd also, we would, we would certainly underline that because it seems to be significant. And as we keep on reading, we realize that it really is significant. Nick mentions the burned over area several times. So we'll mark it here. But as we go on, uh, Nick notices that the, the town has been burned over. 
Um, he had expected to find the scattered um, houses of the town, um, but instead it's all burned over. However, something very important in the next few lines, the river was there. Even though the town is gone, the river remains. The river is reliable even though the town is gone. Now a contrast like that right out of the gate in the, in the first two paragraphs is certainly going to be important, uh, hopefully. Um, so we'll keep, we'll keep reading. But then we notice that it's not just the, the river itself, but there are trout. Nick is watching the trout themselves uh, hold steady in the current. Uh, so it's not just the river that's important, but apparently there's something about these trout. And Nick watches them for a long time. And the fact that this story is called The Big Two-Hearted River, we know that there is probably going to be a river and that it's important to the plot. But here we already we already have a beginning uh, and that, that, that we have some clues as to how to read this story. Nick comes to this town and the town is gone. Civilization is gone. Uh, the humans that were there, the the, um, the community that's there is, is disapp- has disappeared. It's been burned. It's uh, faced tragedy and it's, and it's gone now. But what hasn't disappeared is the river and the trout. Okay, so we already see some interesting themes developing already in the first two paragraphs. <clears throat> at the at the next the bottom of the third paragraph, Nick sees some big trout at the bottom, um, big trout looking to hold themselves in the gravel, uh, bottom in a varying mist of gravel and sand, raised raised in spurts by the current. That's probably pretty important. These big trout uh, seem to be putting in a lot of effort to keep themselves on the bottom of the of the of the river. At least that's how this sentence seems to be worded. That could be a clue, uh, a connection between the, the trout and Nick, and that might be why Nick is so interested in looking at them. As we go on to the next paragraph, there's another interesting uh, line. Nick says, or Nick thinks, it's a long time since he had looked into a stream and seen trout, and so. Our question that comes the question that comes to mind immediately is where has he been? Right? If he's a fisherman, then he probably hasn't been away from a trout stream for too long. But the way this is worded seems to be that he's been away from this area for quite a while and he's coming back for the first time in a long time. And so automatically we would ask, where has he been? Why is this why are these trout so very satisfactory? Why does he stay and look at the at the river for so long? Why didn't he know about Sini? If he's been here before, if he had expected the town to be there, why didn't he know that it was gone now? So, just looking at our first column, we've already we've already marked up some lines. Um, nothing here really that we would put a a cue next to a quote. Um, nothing really up to this point yet that. Uh, stands out as something that we would check mark necessarily. Um, we know that there's some interesting things developing here between the river and the reliability of the river and the um, the abandonment of the town, uh, but we don't really know what to do with, with that yet. So there's nothing else really to mark except for uh, writing some annotations in the margins and underlining some key phrases. As we move over to the next uh, column, we have this single, uh, this, this two sentence paragraph as Nick sees the trout move to, to um, the trout moves to take something off the water, a, a fly off the water, his heart tightened as the trout moved. He felt all the old feeling, and here this is this is the sentiment of a true fisherman. And he, but notice what's really important is that it's the old feeling. Again, Nick's been gone for quite a while from this river and sees the trout take a fly. Uh, it's recalling old memories, old feelings, and so we know that he's been gone for a while. But we still don't know where, why. We don't know what else is going on. As we go on to the, the couple paragraphs later, we have this very important uh, statement. Nick was happy. He hasn't been here for a while, and we know that. But now suddenly he's happy, and so again we ask the we would ask the question, uh, why, right? Why is he happy? Why did trout and the river cause such joy? And if you, for fishermen, uh, this seems to be an obvious question. But this seems to be the type of joy that doesn't come just from being on a river, anticipating catching fish. It seems like there's something more profound to this joy. And as we keep reading, that's exactly what we find. Um, again, up, up here, Nick begins to he puts his pack on and begins to walk off. 
uh, following the river, and he leaves the burned town behind in the heat, perhaps a significant statement. But then at the, at the end of this paragraph, we are starting to get to some deeper themes. Nick felt that he had left everything behind, the need for thinking, the need to write, other needs. It was all back of him. So at this point, we begin to realize that this trip is, has, is therapeutic in nature. As we go on, uh, from the time he had gotten done off the train, things had been different. So Sini's burned, the country's burned over, but it didn't matter. It couldn't all be burned. And so at this point, we really begin to understand that this, that this is a therapeutic, uh, therapeutic trip. Nick has, has been here before, and he's come back for some reason. To, there's some, some pain that he's suffering or some hurt that he's experienced, and he needs healing, and he's hoping that the, that the river will be uh, what heals him. We don't know why, and we don't know what he's suffering, but we're going to keep going on. Okay. Uh, as we go, as we keep going um, down a bit, there's some uh, setting details that go on. And then there's this interesting line. Uh, about the the Lake Superior Mountains, the height of land of Lake Superior, the very last uh, bit of that he says, if he only looked, if he only half looked, they were there, the far off hills of the height of land. So there's this idea that that the, this height, this uh, heightened land exists, but only if he half looks. They're almost, uh, they only seem to be there in his imagination. Almost, he knows that they're there, but he can't quite see them all the way. And so there's this again adds to the effect. Um, the sense that we get from this story that Nick is looking for something for healing or for some vision or some clarification that he can't quite attain yet. And that's why he's come to the river. As we go on, Nick takes a break and he notices that the grasshopper, the grasshoppers in this area where he is are black. Okay? which This is an odd detail. Um, and any time in a Hemingway story that he takes time to develop a long paragraph describing uh, the animals or natural setting, and he gives you lots of details that that don't seem to be related to the story, we need to stop and and think through why Hemingway would waste, uh, uh, why why, why he would spend so many words describing something that seems so insignificant. Hemingway was a great economist of words, and so when he writes about black grasshoppers, we need to stop and pay attention. And as we keep reading through uh, this paragraph, Nick realizes that the grasshoppers turned black from living in the burned over land. Now this is really important if you know anything about Hemingway. He realized that the fire must have come the year before, but the grass, gr- grasshoppers were all black now. And then he says he wondered how long they would stay that way. So at this point, we would ask, we would realize that the grasshoppers have turned black. It's part of their, it's part of um, just their uh, defensive mechanism. They turn black to match their surroundings so that they don't get eaten by all the birds. And yet we begin to think that this might be connected to Nick, that perhaps he is also suffer. We know that he's suffered some kind of tragedy or some, he has some pain that needs to be healed by the river. And he seems to be just like the grasshopper. Perhaps he also has lived in a burned over land. Perhaps he has suffered some tragedy that has turned him all black now. And perhaps he still, he himself is wondering how long he will stay that way. And so the very first time Nick speaks, he, it, it's a bit hopeful. If he does see himself as the grasshopper uh, living in a burned over land, then Nick uh, says, go on hopper, fly away somewhere. And, and he tosses the, the uh, grasshopper into the air and watches it sail it away. And so this, even though th- this is a great example of what's called uh, Hemingway's iceberg effect, there's a lot more going on below, this, uh, below the surface of the water. There's a lot more going on underneath these words. And in, or- in order to understand Hemingway well, you have to know what he's doing here. And I really think that this paragraph, this idea of the grasshoppers turning black, is an, a- an analogy for what's going on with Nick. Um, as we, if you read more of Hemingway's stories, you learn more about Nick Adams. Uh, we actually, you actually learn that he has fought in the war, uh, World War One. He was injured 
uh, somehow his injuries differ uh, depending on what sort short story you're reading. Uh, but he by by the time he comes back to Sini into the big two hearted river, he um, he's looking for some kind of healing, for some kind of of uh, consolation, some kind of uh, assurance that the world uh, isn't all um, isn't all bombs and and, and wickedness and, and destruction and and uh, and death. And so we really realize that this grasshopper Nick sees uh, sees it as a symbol for himself. And then going on. Um, to the very, and this is the last thing I want to point out. Um, 200 yards down the hill, the fire line stopped. And then it was all sweet fern growing ankle high and clumps of jack pines. Um, this, the, um, the countryside turns uh, from black to green. And given what we've just read about the grasshoppers, we would we would wonder that perhaps Nick is hoping that the green country is will turn him green. Perhaps it will make him vibrant and verdant again. Perhaps it will give new life to him. Maybe it will give him vibrancy and life. And that is where I'm going to stop. I'll leave. Uh, I'll let you continue reading on your own. That should give you some idea of of the things I look for when I'm annotating. Um, if I were to, I didn't have much chance to put in any other asterisk, uh, asterisks or check marks. But if I were to put in uh, a check mark, the one that I would one that I would put in is right here. This therapeutic trip. Um, this is very important because this is a central point. We now know why Nick has, has come to this, uh, has come to Sini, why he's come to the river, and we begin to understand uh, who Nick is and what the conflict of the story is. Why? What's the big problem that the protagonist, that the main character, is facing? I would also put a check mark uh, down here, um, even though we have to read between the lines to understand this. These sentences. This is a clear explanation of what Nick's conflict is. He has lived in some burned over land, uh, the, the no man's land, the wastelands of World War II, and he's looking for, he knows that he's become all black to match his surroundings, and now he's looking for some way to resolve that. He's looking for some way to return to the green sweet fern. Um, he wants that, that uh, the chafing, he wants the chafing of his days as a soldier to now produce some kind of aromatic smell uh, to make everything worth it, or at least to bring some healing to himself. And he hopes that the river is the thing that will do that. So there you go. There's a quick uh, quick tutorial on annotation. On uh, the next lesson, we'll go into the story a little bit more uh, and talk about some of the major themes. Thanks for joining me for the second video in this series. Before you go on to the third video, be sure to do the next three things. First, read the Big Two Hearted River with your pencil. Finish working your way through it, mark it up, annotate it, find the good stuff, and enjoy yourself as you read the story. It's one of my favorite short stories. Second, be sure you keep reading every day at your scheduled times and place. For a while, you can use this time to, re to finish your work on the Big Two Hearted River, and when you're done with that story, go back to the book that you started already. Third, email me any questions you have, and I'll have an answer for you in 24 hours. And now that you're two lessons into the course, Feel free to send me any feedback you might have about it. I'd love to hear from you. The next time, we'll talk about how to make sense of your reading. We'll discuss how to use a reading journal to process what you've read, to analyze the author's message and message methods, and how to bring all of your reading and thinking together into one place. Before you go off to read, do one thing for me. If this video was helpful, take a minute and tell someone else about the course. In the resources sections below, there are a couple links for social media. If you click on either of those links, they'll take you to a page where you can share the link to the sign-up page for this course. Thanks for doing that. Your friends will thank you as well. Until next time, here's to your reading life.